awesome. Thank you for having me. Yes, I did get slotted into the uh, the machine learning track with a European regulations talk. So clearly, I tricked the uh, the AI there. Uh, so clearly, you couldn't get enough of GDPR. So I'm here with another four letter regulatory acronym to tell you all about what's happening in 2019 with PSD2. Uh, so this is a payments regulation that's going to be affecting mostly Europe, um, as you can imagine, but really, really everyone that's going to be interacting with uh, any customers or payments or buyers in the EU. Uh, specifically today, I'm going to be talking a lot about the strong customer authentication aspect of this, especially what the dynamic linking requirement of that means. So uh, there's some other aspects of the Payment Services Directive and PSD2 that I'm not going to be getting into in as much detail. Uh, so my name is Kelly Robinson. I work at Twilio. Uh, Twilio is a communications company that allows developers to build communications into applications. Uh, we have APIs for things like SMS and voice. Uh, I work on our authentication products, and so uh, specifically Authy is a company that we acquired about five years ago. Uh, so you might know that from the authentication app but uh, Authy also provides APIs for adding things like two-factor authentication into your applications. Uh, and so along the like strong customer authentication side of things, this is something that I've been working on a lot in the last three months or so. And so this is something that I've been uh, reading a lot about and figured I'd share what I have learned about this with all of you. Uh, so let's start out with some assumptions uh, when it comes to anything to do with identity and verification. Uh, usually this is something that your users have something of value tied to an account, right? Um, and you can't access that uh, unless you uh, authenticate them, right? And so you have to have some kind of authentication system so that they can get into the value of their account. Uh, but there's also this assumption, right, that like there can be an impersonator that will be able to access the value of their account uh, if they can successfully impersonate the people. Uh, and this is a big problem, right? Because account takeovers and uh, this type of stuff has affected a lot of people uh, globally. And so uh, in the last... In 2017, this was a $5.1 billion problem. Uh, and so this is the type of uh, scale that we're looking at and why European regulators started to take notice with this type of stuff. Uh, so you can see the dip there in 2015. That was when chip uh, were in, uh, inserted into credit cards, which helped decrease the amount of fraud. But then people found out ways to get around that, of course. And so now it's creeping back up again. <laughs> So enter the regulatory uh, requirements behind this, uh, especially in Europe, this is something that's uh, more, uh, I, I'm based in, in New York City where um, in America we don't care as much about consumer protection, so thank you Europeans for leading the way on all of this. Uh, and this is based on the original Payment Services Directive, which is actually from 2007, which some of you may remember or maybe not. Uh, the original goals behind this was a lot around uh, consumer protections and leveling the playing field with the uh, uh, the European Union and, and currency transfers and that kind of stuff. Uh, and so you really wanted to create the single market for payments in the EU, meaning that you didn't have to deal with all the different uh, currency transactions and that kind of stuff in order to enable more players to get into the space. There was these requirements around transparency and open APIs and the type of thing that would make it easier for uh, companies like Paysafe and TransferWise and Klarna, just some examples of, of companies that were then enabled in order to do this. You now have these third parties, uh, tech startups essentially, financial technology companies that are able to do money transactions for you, that are able to accept payments on behalf of retailers and that kind of thing without being a bank themselves. Um, I mentioned the consumer protections, uh, cross-border payments and that type of thing. Uh, and with the right authorization, these third-party companies can essentially become a payment institution. And that's why some of these companies are now able to handle money on your behalf without having to become an actual bank themselves. So that was from 2007. They introduced the updated uh, regulations in 2015, uh, and that was uh, governing um, more payment service providers in the EU. A lot of the same stuff still applied, uh, but this one was more focused on card not present or online transactions. And so there was a lot of uh, movement since 2007 in the e-commerce uh, e space and some of these peer-to-peer -peer payments um, and that type of thing. And so they wanted to update the regulations around this and how it would affect different people. Uh, and so again, 
again, I want to emphasize that this is regardless of where the business is based. So if your customers and the people that are using your service are located in the EU, much like GDPR, this is going to apply. So even if your business operates out of a different uh, continent, then you still have to cons be concerned about this. So most of PSU2 went into effect in January of 2018. So why am I up here talking about this? Uh, because there's some new stuff that's going into effect this year. Uh, in September, there's this uh, uh, requirement for strong customer authentication that is going to start to be enforced. And that's for any uh, purchase over 30 euros. And essentially what this means is that if you are going to be doing any card not present transaction, you're going to start to have to use multi-factor authentication on top of that in order to authenticate these processes and these payments are actually going to the people who you say they're going to. And that Really, it's consumer protection to make sure that the consumers know and understand that they're sending money to whatever entity that they're sending the money to. Uh, like I mentioned, there's also some uh, additional uh, requirements around uh, uh, transparency and data encryption that are coming along with PSG2. I'm not going to get into those uh, two pillars of the uh, legislation as much today, but if you have any questions about that after, I can point you to some resources. So there's a few scenarios where the strong customer authentication applies. Uh, the first scenario is when the payer is accessing uh, online payment information. And so this is a scenario like if they're looking at like a bank statement. Uh, and so this doesn't necessarily have to be them necessarily transferring money, but if they're getting information about their account, um, sensitive information, then that is where you might need to apply strong customer authentication. Uh, second, if they're initiating electronic payments. Uh, so this is what most people are thinking of when it comes to this type of stuff. And so this is uh, purchasing something, sending someone money, making a withdrawal, something like that when you're actually transferring money into or out of an account. Um, and then finally, basically, <laughs> carries out a risky transaction uh, through a remote channel. And so if you're online and you do something like this could be like adding a new uh, recipient to your account, so adding a new payee to your account, uh, changing the address on file. The language here is up for interpretation, but this can be thought of as something that's like a risky uh, transaction that you might see like, uh, one way that you see this enforced now with a, a multi-factor authentication or re-authentication is like if you go in to change your password on a website, you change your shipping address or something like that, often websites are re-prompting you to authenticate because that's a sensitive action that they want to make sure that you're the one that's doing that. So in any of those scenarios, what the legislation now requires is that you have these authentication factors and that you have multiple, at least two of them um, being applied. And so uh, when we talk about authentication factors, factors are one of three things. So it's something that you know, something that you have, or something that you are. So something that you know, this is known as inherence, or, uh, and so this is, uh, or, sorry, flipped those. Uh, something that you know is known as knowledge, and so that's something like a password. Um, so this is a very common thing that's being used in most accounts right now. Um, something that you have is like a physical key. It could be like a YubiKey or a mobile phone is what's used as something that you know often with something like SMS-based multi-factor authentication. And finally, something that you are or inherence is usually biometric data. Um, I, I like to remind people, please don't store biometric data on your servers. The reason that this works for companies like Apple and Google is because they are only storing the biometric data on your device. You do not want to be the people that are responsible for a leak of biometric data if you were decided to try to uh, store that on your own servers. So unless you're a device manufacturer, probably don't want to go with the inherence. And so most people are using possession and knowledge as their two factors. And so we're going to be focusing on those two today. Uh, and so this already happens in the physical world of payments, right? Uh, so this is something that's been happening for a long time. The classic example of like a physical form of multi-factor authentication is a debit card and a PIN number. And so that's something that you have in the form of the card and something that you know in the form of a PIN number. So that's two things that you uh, are using to authenticate that transaction if you're making the purchase in person. But what happens when you move that online, right? Like you don't have the same type of guarantees. If somebody just knows your credit card number, you still want to be able to make sure that somebody has access to other information about you uh, and so that you can use a second factor to authenticate that the person is actually making the payment. So this is going to affect you because starting September 14th, non-compliant transactions will be declined. 
TBD how well they're going to enforce this, but you know, this is a big deal and you probably don't want to risk it if this is something that's going to affect your business. Uh, but specifically, I want to talk about this idea of dynamic linking, which is the um, big requirement under strong customer authentication, because it's not just that you have to send the second factor. There's this idea that the second factor also has to explain information about the transaction that's happening, and that's wrapped up into this idea of dynamic linking. And so there's a few things that this uh, encompasses. And so first, it's that each transaction must have a unique authentication code. That code doesn't necessarily have to be derived from information about the payment, but it just has to be a unique identifier. Um, it has to be specific uh, to the transaction amount and the recipient, and so the message has to contain that information. And so you can see in this example that it has both who you're sending the money to and the amount of uh, uh, money that you're sending. Uh, and then finally, that both the amount and the recipient are shown to the payer. And so this is uh, telling you exactly what you're go uh, doing in this, uh, in this transaction. But there's a few security requirements behind this. That's not just the amount of the information that you have to include in the actual message. And this is where it starts to get a little bit confusing. And so this is actually verbiage taken straight from the requirements itself, and I'll try to explain those a little bit more. Uh, so the first requirement is that the payer is made aware of the amount in the payment transaction and of the payee. And so this is something that we kind of already talked about. And so the value of the transaction, the identity of the recipient uh, must be displayed. Uh, so it's, for example, if you're sending $45 or $45 Euro to Bob Smith, um, or if you're buying 80 euros worth of uh, shoes from Amazon.com, uh, this information needs to be visible to the person who's making that transaction um, and to the payer who's being authenticated. Uh, so the legislation doesn't actually specify how to make the payer aware, and so there's some several options that you're going to have for doing that. Um, so it can be displayed on the payment interface itself, it could be displayed in the web browser, or it could be displayed in a mobile application. Uh, and really the goal here is to ensure that the user is confident that they are authenticating the right transaction. And so you really want to make sure that the user is aware of what they're doing so that they don't accidentally send, you know, $7,000 to someone that they were only trying to send $7 to. And so this, the, the goal behind this is both consumer protections, but also um, in a way it can protect the business itself from making mistakes on behalf of the customer as well. Uh, so second, the authentication code generated is specific to the amount of the payment transaction and the pay agreed to by the payer when initiating the transaction. Love legalese. Uh, so this means that if you don't, uh, that any code that you intend to use to authenticate a transaction must only be used for that transaction. So you don't, like I said, actually need to derive that code from the transaction details. It can be a random generated number. Uh, you could generate it, but you know that's up to you. But you just need to maintain a reference between that specific payment uh, and the code that you generated. And so, for example, you could use like a UID for this, um, and then uh, try that to like the six-digit code that you're sending to the payer. And then next, and I'm going to cut this off a little bit because. Too much words is scary, but uh, so this is related to the last point, uh, but with one difference. This is not about the codes that are generated. This is about the codes that are accepted. And so the authenticated code that's accepted, uh, and so when you're checking whether or not the code is correct, uh, this needs to correspond to the specific amount. And so you both have to tie a reference when you're sending the code and when you're checking the code. Uh, and so once a valid code is accepted, that code can only be used uh, uh, for one code can only be used per, per transaction. And so once again, if you are, there was no requirement over how you generate the code or how you display this code to users. And so there's several different channels that you could use for this. And so you could send it via the web browser, via a mobile device. You could send it via an SMS, via a push notification. Uh, if you've worked with any kind of authentication systems before, you might know that sometimes people are like, I didn't get it, I didn't get it, let me try something else. And like, so if people end up requesting it from multiple different locations, if you you send somebody a code via an SMS and they ended up accepting it via a push notification, that SMS code is no longer valid. And finally, any change to any details about the transaction invalidates the original code. And so this is something that's going to be applicable if somebody says, oh, okay, I don't want to send this money to Jane, I want to send this to Jill. 
uh, that's one way that it invalidates the code. But also if you're like, oh, I didn't want to send Jane $12, I wanted to send Jane uh, 13 euros, that's something that also would change and invalidate the original code. Uh, and so, and that's not just like any code, it's all outstanding codes are then invalid if any de details about the transaction changes. And so there's a few different ways that you can actually implement this. Um, and this is largely similar to some of the details if you're going to be implementing any kind of multi-factor authentication for a login system. And so if you already have anything like this in your system that is being used for login, then this is something that you might be able to transfer over. And there's uh, some other details depending on who your payment <laughs> service provider is that they might have already taken care of this for you. And so if you're already using a service like Stripe, uh, they already have... Uh, things and systems in place. Uh, there's other services out there that are implementing this for you. And so depending on who your payment service provider is, if you're using one, if you are a payment service provider, there's a good chance that you're gonna have to implement this yourself if you haven't already. But these are some of the options that you have if you're going to uh, roll your own. And so there's options out there, I think like 3D Secure is another one, some of you might be using that. Um, so let's talk through some of the different options here and some of like the cost benefit with different uh, uh, options here. And so SMS is the first option that you're going to have. This is something that we end up seeing like a lot of people go with be just because there's no app install required. And so it ends up being the easiest thing for most of your users to use. Uh, users have SMS phones these days enabled. Usually people have texting plans that allow them to accept codes. And so this ends up being a pretty low friction way to get people in using something like like this. Um, usually when you're sending an SMS message, you're already specifying the uh, data and the message body that's going to be included in that. And so it's really easy to then add additional information about like the amount of money that you're sending someone or the person that you're sending it to. And so this is a pretty like low friction way to do this. Downsides here is that there's been obviously, maybe not obviously, if you've heard of um, any of like the SIM swapping attacks or the SS7 vulnerabilities, SMS has been getting a lot of flack lately for not being quite as secure as some other forms of communication communication. Um, we can talk through some of those like uh, vulnerabilities if you'd like, but uh, basically what happens is that SMS is a lot more vulnerable to phishing attacks. Uh, you can go into, uh, uh, you know, Vodafone and say like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm Kelly and I want access to her SIM card. And if you successfully convince the uh, retail person there that you are me, then you all of a sudden have access to all of my data. You know, I am a US based customer. I am currently roaming. There are some insecurities in the uh, telephony networks that through the roaming process, there's this thing known as the signaling system seven that you can actually convince somebody that you're just a carrier and that you want them to forward all of your messages to you. Um, that's not something that most people need to be worried about. That's more of like a state actor type threat, but you know, sometimes it's fun to talk about the uh, crazy things that people are doing to get into your accounts. Uh, so mainly there, just don't be tweeting about how much Bitcoin that you own because otherwise people probably won't target you. If you advertise the fact that you have have $500,000 in Bitcoin on Twitter, you might all of a sudden be a target. Who would have guessed? Um, another thing, if you've ever heard of um, or used TOTP before, and so this is something that you would see with an app like Google Authenticator or Authy, um, this is really interesting because it uh, works offline. And so like, you know, if I wasn't paying for roaming right now, this is something that I could use um, on a plane or in a foreign country. And so the way that this works is it's based on math, everybody's favorite. So there's uh, two inputs to the transactional um, time-based one-time password, which is what the TOTP stands for. And so that's both a secret key that's shared between the, um, the device and the server, and then the current system time of, the, uh, of both devices. And if those are synced properly, then they will basically go through a formula, hash the number, um, and truncate it down to get the same token so that you can verify that the device that has the secret key also has uh, the same information as the server and the secret key that's tied to your account there. Uh, so for you to do this, you need an app like Authy in order to do this. Uh, the way that we have implemented this is kind of clever, and so uh, the downside of it being offline, right, is like how can you get information about a transaction if you're offline? Like you need details about what's happening there in order to get information to display things like uh, this is for Owlmar and this is so many euros of the transaction. Uh, and so what happens is from the original uh, TOTP that you're being, that you've scanned into your device, you then do a second scan of details about the transaction. And so you do have to have a, a, like a QR code that's displayed to the 
user in that circumstance, but you can do this offline. The user then scans the QR code. The details of the transaction are then mixed with the original seed that we used uh, to create that TOTP. And then all of a sudden, you kind of have this like sub-derived transactional one-time password that's time-based and can be used offline. Uh, so this is slightly more secure than SNMS. Uh, it uses, you know, symmetric key cryptography, which sounds a lot fancier. And so this is something that you might be willing to offer your users as like another option uh, if you don't want to support SMF, if you're worried about the security implications there, or if you just want to support other options for people. Uh, the next option that we have is something called push authorization. Uh, and so this is something that you might see with apps like Dual Authenticator. Um, Google Prompt has started doing this. And so this is a really like uh, nice user experience for people so that it will pop up and say like, hey, I see you're trying to do something. Uh, most often this has been used in a login context. And so say, are you, so you're trying to log into this account, is this you, yes or no? There's some benefits with this. This uses public key cryptography, which is like slightly more secure than the symmetric. So you can say, like, if you want to go get audited, you can say, this is cryptographically more secure, which sounds even better. Uh, but this is also nice because it gives people some feedback about what's happening. So you can uh, implement, you need to implement some kind of webhook or polling option on top of like when somebody hits yes, like you obviously need to take some action there in order to process whatever they were trying to do. Usually that's logging them into the site. It could also be you know, any kind of sensitive action like payments, like changing information on your account. Uh, but then you can also do that same type of interaction if somebody presses no. And so this is also a way to start to detect more phishing attacks. And so if people are trying to DDoS somebody and log in, say they have access to the first factor, and so they have access to the username and password, and they're trying to you know, DDoS somebody with this, if you get too many no or even one no, you can start to take action on that, which is not really something that's available with any other kind of 2FA. And so this is a really clever way to start to get information about what people are doing with different types of login requests or with different types of sensitive actions. You can start to basically build up metrics and data about how many people are not only like responding to this, but you can see uh, people who ignore it, people who respond yes, and people who respond no. Um, so this is a lot more uh, easy to integrate for the user aspect because the user only has to press one button. They don't have to input any type of code. Uh, and then it's also easy for you to customize this to the brand because this is something that you can put into an app. You can put your logo in there and so it's all like beautiful. Uh, and then you can also, most of these push authorization come pre-filled. They expect you to provide some information about the request already and so you can start to include information about like, where this request was taking place, uh, who you were sending the money to, and so you can see an example of like how Gemini uses this for uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum transactions. Um, and so this is something like if you've ever used TransferWise, they use this um, uh, something like this in order to approve transactions as well. Uh, downsides of push authorization is that it is going to also require that your users have an app. You can either use a different uh, an app that provides a service like this, like I mentioned, like um, like Duo, Google Prompt, or uh, there's also SDKs out there that allow you to build this into your application itself, which is great if you have people and customers that are already using your applications. And so for fintech companies like uh, Robinhood in the US is an example of this, is like they were an app first company, right? And so somebody like them, it would be really easy for them to say there's a, a good expectation that all of their users are going to have the app because that was the only way that anybody could sign up for that. Obviously, if you're a company that's been around more than 10 years or a company that has a personal or a website that you know is catering to users that might not have smartphones, it's going to you know have some your mileage may vary type uh, expectations around uh, if this is something that you can reasonably expect that your users uh, will use, will download an app, and if you need to offer backups like SMS. Uh, so researchers like Gartner and Forrester do recommend push-based authentication systems, um, and this is because they are slightly more secure. SMS does have those vulnerabilities, and they do remove those opportunities for phishing. Uh, push-based authentication systems can't be phished in the same way that uh, SMS-based uh, transactions can, because there's really not the opportunity for man-in-the-middle attacks based on the way that they verify all of the different details of each uh, transaction or approval or denial that comes through there. 
but one thing that I do want to talk about is like this is something that there's going to be uh, any kind of time that you add security into your application, you're adding friction in, right? Security is kind of always this uh, fun dance between the amount of, especially any time you're doing like account security or user facing security features, there's this dance between like the user experience and how secure you want something to be. And so you can make things incredibly secure, but then nobody would ever be able to actually use your product. And so you still need to be able to get people to use your product because unfortunately too much friction is also going to mean like abandoned carts if you're using this for some kind of e-commerce use case. Uh, if you're trying to get people to approve a transaction before they like check out of the website, if they've already given you their information, the more steps that you add into this process, right, is going to increase the amount of time that it takes for somebody to actually get to the process of uh, checking out of their cart and giving you money. And so that's going to uh, potentially impact the amount of time that, or amount of sales that you have. Uh, and so uh, when you're implementing these things, keeping the user experience in mind and trying to uh, come up with different options to offer people in order to keep them happy <laughs> and keep them uh, engaged in the buying process is going to be uh, one of the things that's going to be challenging. Um, yeah, time is money, and so any kind of slow, slow down of your transaction uh, is going to increase uh, uh, the amount of friction that you have, could lead to sewer, fewer sales. And so the recommendation here is to offer multiple options and make it as easy for the user as possible. And so uh, Shopify has done something interesting with this where they've actually kind of sped up the process in a way by offering this as a way to autofill the sales uh, transaction. And so if you're logging into Spotify and you give them your phone number, or Shopify, sorry, not Spotify. Uh, if you're logging into Shopify and you give them your phone number, all of a sudden that also will pre-fill some details about your shipping address and your billing address. And then you, uh, that actually is a kind of a user delight because you're like, oh, I don't have to provide that information again. This is actually a security uh, uh, addition that's also making my life a little bit easier. Uh, and so you can start to think about things like that. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of ironic because one of the original goals of the payment services directive, of the original payment services directive, was also speed up payments. Uh, and so this was something that they were trying to make sure that like, if you were trying to withdraw money from a bank, they wanted to open the playing field and get more tech companies in there that would make it so that you weren't trying to, that you didn't have that payment take like three days, right? And so, you know, now we're talking not in the uh, order of magnitude of days, but more like the order of magnitude of milliseconds, but this is still something that's going to affect your end users. And so in terms of what's next, like this kind of depends on what kind of business you're running. Uh, so if you're a payment service provider, uh, definitely something that hopefully you're already thinking about. Um, and then if you are a business, an e-commerce uh, business, or a financial services business of any other kind, uh, what are you using for your payment service provider? Do they already provide a solution for this, or is this something that you have to build yourself? Uh, and then if you do need to build your own solution, like what makes sense for your customers, and what is going to be the best way that they can be engaged in this process? Uh, if you have any more uh, uh, questions about this, there's a bunch of resources that I can recommend. Um, and so there's more details there about like how, what dynamic linking is. I will post these slides after so all of these links are up there. Uh, and so there's some more details there. I can definitely recommend some of those. Even just like reading the Wikipedia article and going to all those links is really informative on all of this stuff because it'll help you uh, make more de informed decisions about like what is relative for your business. Um, in terms of like the implementing SCA, those are all like Twilio links because that's what I know how to do. Um, in it depends on like what your uh, implementation goals are. I can definitely point you to other stuff. Uh, so hopefully I've given you a better understanding of some of the things that you might need to be thinking about in the next six months before this uh, t goes into effect. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to be around. Uh, my name is Kelly Robinson, and thank you for listening.